Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Leo Hartwell. I am a Sokhrov Fellow at LSE Ideas. Welcome to another LSE Ideas Russia-Ukraine Dialogue. Our dialogues take place every Tuesday. Uh, since, the, since February, more than 1,500 schools, colleges, and kindergartens have been damaged. 118 of them were completely destroyed as a direct result of Russia's military aggression in Ukraine. Last week, riding on the wave of Russia's denazification propaganda, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that Ukraine could still have Nazi elements, even if some figures, including the country's president, were Jewish. Lavrov added that, and I quote here, Hitler also had Jewish origins. Meanwhile, the EU has failed to agree on, Russian, on a Russian oil ban. Uh, now, we have a lot to cover today. Our topic will focus on frontline states. And it's not so much what countries do in peacetime, but in wartime that ultimately matters most. That said, let's turn to our distinguished panel to focus on reactions from Belarus, Hungary, Poland, and Romania. My first guest that I would like to introduce is Katia Glod. She's a non-resident fellow with the Center for European Policy Analysis Russia program. Uh, Katia is an independent analyst, and a political risk consultant based in London. She's originally from Belarus and a specialist on the politics and economics, uh, and economics of former Soviet countries. Our second guest is uh, Dr. Peter Kreko. He is the executive director of Political Capital, an independent policy research analysis and consulting institute based in Budapest. He's also a senior fellow um, at SIPA and a popback fellow at the University of Cambridge. Thirdly, uh, I'd like to introduce Bogdan Zvadevich. Uh, he's a research fellow at the Center for Eastern Studies. His main areas of interest include political cleavages in Central and Eastern Europe, separate strategies among peripheral elites, the impact of external actors in the Balkan region and socio-political developments in, post, in the post-Soviet space. space. Finally, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ionella Maria Tsiolan. Um, she is a Brussels-based foreign policy and security expert and a board member of the Transatlantic Alumni Network. Until recently, uh, she worked as a research fellow at the European Policy Center, a think tank based in Brussels. Her, think, her expertise include the Central and Eastern European region. Now, before we start for context, uh, I'd like to remind our audience that the UN says that as of 27th of April, more than 5.3 million people have fled Ukraine. Poland has absorbed nearly 3 million refugees. Romania, uh, 800,000. Hungary, nearly half a million. And Belarus, about 25,000. Now let's start with Belarus. So Katia, I'm going to turn to you if you could unmute for us, please. Belarus is a landlocked country of some 9 million people and it shares borders, uh, a border of over 1,000 kilometers with Ukraine. Belarus also served as the staging ground for 30,000 Russian troops in the months preceding the full-scale military invasion. At the same time, Belarus borders three NATO member countries. Now, relations between Russia's President Putin and Belarus's illegitimate president Lukashenko have not always been warm. For decades, Lukashenko positioned Belarus between Russia and the Western world. And I remember in the 2010s especially, he seemed eager to integrate more with the West. But the 2020 disputed presidential election in Belarus marked a turning point for Lukashenko. Can you shed some light on that event and tell us how the Russia-Ukraine war has impacted Belarus? Thank you, Katya. Well, thank you very much, Leon. Um, thank you for the invitation, and it's great to be here in this um, discussion and to hear about other countries, <clears throat> the frontline countries that have been uh, um, impacted by the war in Ukraine. Well, coming back to your question, um, it is indeed the um, August 2020 presidential election is perhaps the um, development which, which has greatly impacted um, Belarus' role in um, this Russian war against Ukraine, basically the fact that 
Belarus has become a co-aggressor state in the war. Um, the reason for that is that indeed Lukashenko lost legitimacy in 2020. Um, uh, his uh, official result was around 60%, but um, independent alternative um, vote counts indicated that his main opponent, um, Svetlana Sikhanovskaya, may have won already in the first round. And this is how the public actually perceives Lukashenko. Since uh, um, August 2020, basically his public support has not gone up. Um, and it remains very low. It's um, about 25-30%. And um, this reality that uh, the Belarusian public did not recognize the election as legitimate, did not recognize Lukashenko as a legitimate president, um, obviously pushed Lukashenko closer to Putin. He had to rely on Putin politically and economically. The West um, has uh, um, severed its um, relations with, uh, with the official Minsk, Minsk, with the regime in Belarus. And um, the only uh, um, uh, political leader, important political leader, who supported Lukashenko was Putin. Putin also promised um, to, give, to give Belarus some financial assistance, although Belarus needs much more than it has received so far. But nonetheless, um, in the context when uh, uh, the West has imposed um, significant uh, um, and comprehensive economic sanctions against Belarus, um, uh, Russia indeed became the um, um, last resort for Lukashenko, for, as I said, for his political and for his economic support. And when Putin decided to um, unleash a war on Ukraine, um, uh, Belarus did not really have my choice. And perhaps the, the main consequence uh, um, of this um, <clears throat> lost uh, I mean, officially not lost, but unofficially lost election and the loss of legitimacy that Lukashenko experienced in August 2020 was the fact that Belarus had to let its territory be used um, to attack Ukraine. And that was, we saw that that was a very unpopular decision. Um, uh, uh, Lukashenko's security services, the military, they seem to be unaware, unaware of, of the fact that Belarus will be dragged into this war. Um, it looks like Lukashenko didn't know that himself until very um, early hours on uh, the um, um, 24th of February when, when the war started. And uh, so the first consequences, the first impact of the war on Ukraine is the fact that Belarus has to, um, uh, was pushed by Lukashenko to become a, um, a co-aggressor state and to take a completely different position from what Belarusian people would have liked to see. According to the um, latest service, public opinion, opinion service, we see that Belarusian public between um, between 97, 86 and 97 percent do not support sending Belarusian troops to Ukraine, Ukraine to fight along Russian troops. We also see that around 60 percent do not support um, uh, uh, Russian military activity in, uh, in Ukraine either. And we see from some very direct evidence that uh, um, the security services and the military in Belarus, they are also very much um, against um, Belarus being part of it. Well, so far Lukashenko has managed to um, avoid sending Belarusian troops to Ukraine, and that's probably not because uh, um, he, <clears throat> not because that was his own decision, but probably because Putin did not really see much um, added value in uh, value added in sending Belarusian troops to to Ukraine. Belarusian army is um, not very big. I mean, it's forty five thousand, but it's uh, all not professional army. It uh, consists of conscripts. It doesn't have really combat experience, and it has even uh, um, perhaps lower morale than the Russian army because many Belarusians have connections with Ukraine. Um, also, the leader of the Belarusian Democratic Opposition appealed to the Belarusian soldiers not to um, participate in, uh, if they were sent to Ukraine, not to find Ukrainian soldiers, but, but rather surrender. And um, 
And that is perhaps one of the main reasons why um, Putin thought that at the moment um, it won't be any, uh, it won't be useful for him to have the Belarusian army in, in Belarus. Um, so I will probably, sorry, in, in Ukraine, um, I'll probably stop here and then we'll continue talking about other, other questions and um, other issues that may be raised. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. Uh, let's turn to, uh, to you, Peter. Um, it's, it's great to have you on this panel, uh, as always. Um, now, uh, Hungary has been on a slippery slope for the past few years, and in fact, Freedom House no longer considers Hungary a democracy. Prime Minister Viktor Orban's admiration for Putin has been rather unique, I would argue, even after Russia's occupation of Crimea. Now, after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February, uh, Orban complained mainly on, the prevent, on preventing the participation of Hungary's forces and weapons in the, in the conflict. Um, uh, at the same time, he supported most of the EU sanctions against Russia. Now, it seems like Orban wants his bread buttered on both sides. Can you tell us more about the Russia -Ukraine, how the Russia-Ukraine war impacted both domestically and in terms of foreign relations. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Anat Leon, and thanks for LSC Ideas for, for having me on this important discussion. Yes, I think you're absolutely right that Hungary's outlier, let's say, I would say in two cells. Uh, first of all, it's outlier because the most, we can hear still the most empathic uh, messages towards <clears throat> Vladimir Putin's Russia from from Hungary and and also the most vocal criticism of Ukraine within the whole European Union. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's an outlier also in the sense that so far the rhetorics coming out of Hungary, I think we're, we're painting a much more negative picture on on the reaction. Of, of Hungary to the whole conflict than if we take a look at the actual behavior uh, of, of, um, of the Hungarian decision makers. And why I'm saying that, because so far the Hungarian government have supported five uh, sanctions, five, five rounds of sanctions, including um, the EU decision, uh, and, and also it supported the EU decision to transfer legal weapons uh, to Ukraine, um, which, which is pretty important. Uh, the most important messages, though, that are coming uh, from Hungary are, uh, first of all, that Hungary was, does not want to be uh, pulled into the war, and second, that uh, Hungary is against energy sanctions, and there will be a a uh, big question right now, if Hungary will support uh, the next round of sanctions, including the uh, including the, the stop on Russian oil, it seems most likely that it won't. But let's, let's return to that later. So to your question, the domestic impact on the Russia-Ukraine war on, on Hungary was a huge election, electoral success or, uh, for Viktor Orban. And um, one reason for that is that Orban could sell himself as, first of all, the defender of the peace. Um, and, and we shouldn't forget that his first trip after he was elected uh, was to the Pope to show up that he is a strong uh, freedom fighter. Second, that Hungary will uh, provide uh, cheap gas and energy to its citizens in a period where we can see huge rises of energy everywhere. And there was a decision in Hungary to put a cap on both the gas and both uh, the fuel. So it resonated quite well uh, to the voters. Uh, but why I'm saying that, that of course, it's not, uh, we cannot be sure about that. And, and the data paints a more complicated picture on what was the real reason for such huge uh, electoral success for Fidesz. Fidesz have gained, Viktor Orban's party have gained 54% of the vote, the biggest electoral success so far. Uh, but of course, it's a multi-causal uh, 
phenomenon that has many, many reasons, the weakness of the opposition, the problems with the uh, opposition candidate and so on. But the feedback that Orban receives is that his foreign policy is good as it is. So that's why I think we should expect more uh, uh, conflicts even with the European Union. And I think more conflicts with, with Ukraine and, and this, this uh, balancing act uh, between Russia and the West and the continuation of that, because the feedback what they have gone is that it's it's good as it is, even if the the impact of the of the war on Hungary's international reputation is horrible. Is uh, Hungary had never been such isolated before, neither in the European Union. Uh, with countries such as Slovakia, Czech Republic, uh, even Poland, uh, the closest allies of Hungary, even um, not just because of regional issues, but also because centuries of European countries have traditionally a different approach to the rule of law uh, mechanisms and, and, and criticisms and, and also decisions coming from Brussels, they are the most afraid that they will they can be targeted by that. And even these countries have very harshly criticized and loudly Hungary for its outlierism and especially rhetorical outlierism. Um, also, we can see in the transatlantic dimension, Hungary also have never been uh, so isolated. Hungary was quite visibly missing even before the war from the, um, uh, from the democracy conference that was uh, organized in uh, the pre-conference that was organized uh, by the United States. And also we can expect, uh, and Hungary was, was a blind spot when there is and still is a blind spot when there are uh, US um, meetings and, and US visits to Central Eastern Europe. Budapest is the city that is not visited by right now by US uh, decision makers. Uh, so the diplomatic effect was disastrous. And uh, given that right now there is a conflict with the European Union over rule of law issues as well, with three branches of the uh, EU money are all in danger, the, the resilience funds, the recovery funds, but also because of the uh, rule of law uh, mechanism that has just been triggered against Hungary, the general strategic and cohesion funds are in danger as well. So right now, it seems like um, Hungary tries to take its role to use, use its veto power as a, as, a, as a bargaining chip or a blackmail potential in the, in the uh, negotiations with Brussels. And what I see right now is rather a downward spiral of more and more criticism coming uh, from uh, the West for Hungary's rule of law problems and outlierism in the Ukraine issue. And the reaction is a more and more stubborn outlierism in both dimensions. So, so far, it's hard to say any hard law optimistic about the foreign policy outlook of Hungary in the context of this uh, whole conflict. Thank you, Peter. We'll pick up more on some of those issues you mentioned uh, regarding this, this delicate balancing act uh, that, that Orban is performing at present uh, in uh, some of the following questions. Let's first uh, now turn to Bogdan, please, uh, from Poland. Now, Bogdan, uh, Poland was previously kind of, uh, um, you know, seen in the same corner as Hungary on a variety of issues, some not so good over the past few years, you know, um, but now it's emerged as a crucial member of this anti-Russia alliance. Uh, you've given a lot of support, uh, political uh, as well as, uh, you know, humanitarian and, and, and economic support to Ukraine. Um, we also know that Poland uh, is host to, as I mentioned earlier, three million Ukrainian refugees. So why don't we start maybe with that uh, the refugee crisis, especially with regards to how it's being managed by Poland and how it is impacting Polish society. Thank you, Bogdan. Uh, so, well, thank you. Thank you for having me uh, with you today. Uh, well, yes, I mean, this refugee uh, issue, uh, we probably most likely will have the most, I mean, will have most transformative impact on our society and state. 
Um, so as you mentioned, um, in the last two months, over 3 million Ukrainians have passed the Polish-Ukrainian border. However, according to the official data, uh, I mean, that rely on the number of registered refugees, uh, one over 1 million people uh, stayed in Poland, I mean, 1 million Ukrainians, uh, that the rest of them most likely moved uh, towards or farther to the to the west, to the other Western, uh, Western European countries. Uh, and there's even freight, uh, third data that's probably more precise uh, and re it relies on the number of uh, Ukrainian SIM cards used on the Polish territory. And this one says that there's a, over 1.6 million uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, on Polish territory at the moment. Um, so regarding the, the support and the help that is provided to Ukrainian refugees in Poland, uh, I would say that it is of a twofold character. So on one hand, we have a uh, you know, quite well-structured, organized, institutionalized form of support that comes from the Polish state. On the other, we have um, a mass mobilization and kind of, you know, ad hoc, spontaneous reaction of our society uh, to this crisis. Uh, concerning the, the former, uh, Poland from the, from the very beginning uh, has been providing very significant, important uh, support to Ukrainian refugees. Of course, it was a it's 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 a huge challenge for our institutions. Uh, although I must say that um, quite relatively fast, uh, that certain uh, certain rules and procedures were established. The most important thing was to uh, register uh, the refugees in order to give them a the access to all public services. So our government, as I mentioned before, issues this um, um, personal identification number, it's called PESEL. And with this number, uh, refugees uh, can claim all benefits, including child benefit. Uh, they have access to public health care system. They have access to uh, educational system. Um, and also they can, uh, they have rights to legally work in Poland. So they have access to labor market, market which is, you know, in long-term perspective seems to be crucial. Um, so we also like to have this scheme of uh, so-called uh, welcome money for, for all people crossing the border. It's not a big amount of money, but still, you know, something that, that uh, people can, uh, can use. Uh, so at the same time, since there's a lot of Polish citizens hosting Ukrainian refugees, the government introduced a law that provides some financial assistance to, to, to the hosts. So every person who hosts um, uh, Ukrainian refugees, Ukrainian citizens, can uh, get uh, a, a little, little money to cover, uh, cover the expenses. I mean, little is relatively high in, in Polish terms. Uh, so this is like the, so besides then the government uh, has been also organizing the special um, uh, centers to host refugees. Um, I must also mention that um, this, mm, we had like two waves of, of refugees in Poland since the beginning of war. In the first wave, we had this massive uh, migration, right? We had over 2.5 million people that moved to Poland in the first four weeks. And when the situation in Ukraine, the northern part, uh, stabilized, meaning the Russians, when the Russian troops withdraw from the northern part of Ukraine, the number of refugees uh, decreased. Uh, and at the same time, we could observe uh, people returning to Ukraine. I mean, uh, on a daily basis, it's about 15 to 20,000 people, Ukrainians, going back, traveling back to, to Ukraine. Uh, so this is the this more like the institutional aspect of the refugee crisis. Uh, then if we look at the actions taken by, by ordinary citizens, uh, this is really incredible. I mean, um, people like from, again, from the very beginning, they were uh, heading to the border with their cars to pick up the, the refugees, to take them to their uh, places. Uh, and, you know, they were also like kind of organizing the humanitarian aid, uh, collecting the, the things, the items like the clothes and the, uh, and, uh, children, the food for children, and so on. We even have a situation where um, the whole institutions, like let's say orphanages, have been transferred to Poland. And this also represents a huge, huge challenge for, for our country. Uh, so yeah, so we have this, this uh, two kinds of actions taken by, uh, by the state and the society. Uh, however, as I said before, this all represents a, a huge 
challenge to, for us. I mean, I must, so before the, this refugee crisis, I would say Poland was a relatively homogeneous society, right? Uh, we, uh, well, ethnically, uh, ethnically, our structure was quite homogeneous. Uh, so in this sense, this uh, huge influx of refugees will definitely transform uh, the society. You know, in a, so the, the consequences will be long, long, long uh, lasting. Uh, when it comes to the our uh, state structures, uh, we are already facing some difficulties. Uh, let's say in the schooling system, where the you know school classes are overcrowded since we have a lot of children from Ukraine. Uh, the government has set up a special program to uh, to somehow create the new sc uh, school classes, also to provide the. Uh, uh, the Ukrainian children with uh, language uh, language courses. There is certain language barrier, and uh, you know this is just one example. Um, also, we have to uh, have to admit that we uh, probably won't be able to carry on this burden alone. So there are high expectations towards our Western partners to also participate in this uh, in this process of uh, hosting the the Ukrainian refugees. Uh, this already has some money provided by the EU. There are actually free sources of EU money that could be used to cover the uh, the life expenses of expenses of Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees. Uh, we can we are we are allow, allowed to use the, the EU funds, the cohesion funds that we uh, did not we failed to use uh, in uh, in the previous uh, budget perspective. Uh, there's also this uh, post. Uh, COVID recovery scheme that uh, to, where we can also transfer some amount of money from from that fund to the to the refugees, uh, and the third third source is the um, EU uh, migration fund. Um, it's about four million euros, so also a very significant amount of money. Um, but as I said, um, also concerning the future, uh, a lot depends uh, on the developments in Ukraine. Uh, how, if so, in case the Russia pro uh, progresses with its uh, military activities, uh, we may actually expect uh, a new waves of uh, refugees coming in uh, in coming coming in following months. Uh, and uh, as I said, we must be we must be prepared prepared for that. So, uh, so I will stop here and. Yeah. So we can continue. Thank you very much, uh, Bogdan. And um, while we, uh, just before I give the floor to Ionella, um, I just want to remind our audience also that uh, that LSE, LSE's uh, student union set up a fund to support uh, Ukrainian refugees, and we will drop the link in the comment section. Uh, Ionella, let's turn to you. Um, you're in Brussels, which of course you're from Romania, uh, and you know a lot about the region. So we'll ask you a few others other questions about the region a little bit later. But let's start with Romania. Uh, now Romania has the longest NATO slash EU border with Ukraine of about just over 600 kilometers, right? Um, how has the Russian invasion of Ukraine impacted the security of Romania, and how has Romania responded so far? Thank you. Thank you very much, Leon, and uh, I'm very honored to be today with you. Uh, I will start with the positive. The Russian war on Ukraine brought more NATO in Romania. So what does it mean in practice is the fact that NATO created um, this um, recently rotational battle group in Romania, led by France, and basically what they did, uh, they updated their defense posture to one fourth um, posture from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Uh, this is the, the good part. And also we have now um, double the troops, the American troops in the state, from 1,000 to approximately uh, 2,000 American troops uh, on Romanian territory. So these were the positive um, elements. Nevertheless, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the recent developments in the south of Ukraine has created a nightmare security environment for Romania on three issues. And I will try to present them briefly. Uh, firstly, Russia's plan to take control of the south uh, of Ukraine creates a maritime insecurity for the Black Sea region. 
And we know already that the security of the Black Sea region is basically the most vulnerable point for both European Union and NATO because neither organization has a strategy, a security strategy towards the region in place at this moment. Um, and because we didn't have this security strategy in place, Russia basically expanded its control over the Black Sea uh, in the past eight years. And uh, the current Kremlin plan to create a land corridor between uh, Donbass and Crimea, in which Mariupol is a strategic point, basically it's part of this uh, endeavor. And taking uh, conquering Mariupol um, means that Russian will be able to control 80% of the Ukrainian coastline of the Black Sea and this is for Romania very threatening because this is just one step in the bigger uh, Russian plan of encroaching the Black Sea and transforming it into a, um, a Russian Mare Nostrum. This is something that the experts will um, and they were speaking about it even before the war. Why this is problematic? For, because from a Romanian perspective, the country doesn't have a very well-developed naval presence. Uh, so uh, usually they rely on um, NATO presence in order to uh, secure the maritime security of the NATO uh, coastal states. Here I'm mentioning Romania and Bulgaria, and also because the country is dependent on NATO air uh, police missions to maintain the security of its airspace. So this was one of the main issues. The second issue for Romania is the fact that the current destabilizing actions in Transnistria might echo in Republic of Moldova. Uh, we are not sure that or if Kremlin wants to create a second uh, front uh, in Moldova by um, creating uh, more tension here, apart from the one in Ukraine. Currently, it seems improbable to have a conventional war in Transnistria, but it's not impossible. So we also have to keep this scenario in mind. Um, and it's important to mention here that the war uh, results in uh, Ukraine are felt in Republic of Moldova which is a tiny state between Romania and Ukraine. And the uh, Kremlin might be interested in destabilizing Moldova in order to change the European course of the country. Currently, the country has a pro-European government, parliament, president. And that means they're interested in integrating in the European Union. And Romania is a highly supporter of uh, Moldovan European aspiration if Russian will succeed somehow to uh, use propaganda or instrumentalize the energy uh, security, uh, they might change the pro-European government with a pro-Russian one. And will not be the first time when they are doing that in Chisinau. So this is another issue for Romania. And the third main issue is that uh, if um, uh, Russia will succeed uh, to conquer the south of Ukraine. Th that means the buffer zone between NATO and Russia will disappear and Romania will become a direct land neighbor with Russia. And this basically it's the uh, a, a very uh, is the worst scenario that keeps Bucharest awake at night because uh, in, we in Romania we are aware of the fact that Russia will not stop here and there might be the possibility for a war on uh, NATO EU land in the future if Russia is not um, stopped at this moment in Ukraine. So these are the main uh, scenarios about what Romania has done so far. So Romania is a big supporter of Ukraine and they helped uh, the country politically by supporting the EU integration of uh, the country. They are also uh, the second largest um, uh, influx of refugee state. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, Romania has taken so far around uh, more than eight, 
200,000 Ukrainian refugees, a part of them are still in Romania. Uh, and uh, also the country created a humanitarian and logistical hub in the northern uh, city, Suchava, on the border with Ukraine, um, to send humanitarian aid within the Ukrainian state. Uh, as well, Romania helps with the cyber security of Ukraine, uh, and uh, it's doing that for a couple of years. And also they um, are interested in helping the country um, in their cereal exports. Uh, Romania made its uh, Constanza port available for uh, Ukraine uh, to export export its cereals to other countries around the world. As um, we know that Kiev was basically uh, cut from its main um, ports on the Black Sea. Um, and these are basically the, the main arguments and we can continue in the Q&A session. Thank you, Nella. Let's go back to Belarus uh, or London to be more specific, but focusing on Belarus. Uh, Katia, uh, you already uh, mentioned a few things uh, related to what Belarus has done so far uh, in support of Putin's war. Perhaps you can expand on some of those issues. And then uh, also more importantly, I think the, the question is also what Belarus has not yet done that, that it could potentially do in support of, of this war and maybe why it hasn't done that. Um, thank you, Leon. Well, basically what Belarus has done is uh, it has allowed Russia to use its territory to attack Ukraine. And that's um, that's the main issue um, for Belarus and for Ukraine and particularly for people in Belarus who are very much against it. We know that about 100 rockets have been fired from, from Belarus. Um, currently, uh, or, or let's say up until now, uh, Belarusian railways have been used very heavily uh, to uh, transport Russian military equipment. Um, Belarusian roads have been used to um, transport Russian troops. And of course, Belarusian military airports have also been used very much. So we do know, however, that recently, and it seems, I mean, saying we do know, there seems to be some evidence of that coming both from the Ukrainian side and also coming from the intelligence, British intelligence, American intelligence, that actually 85% or around 80% of Russian troops and military equipment has now left Belarus. And whether that indicates that uh, um, it will never come back, we don't know. Um, it may mean that at the moment uh, um, Moscow does not want um, to launch an attack on Kyiv, but once it feels stronger, once uh, it has regrouped, um, it might still come back to Belarus um, to use again its territory. Um, what, what Belarus has not done is um, uh, it has not really got involved the Belarusian armed forces uh, um, in Ukraine. And I explained earlier in my presentation what the reasons were for that. And um, uh, perhaps we should also note um, that in the, um, the war also had a, quite a negative um, impact on the domestic politics in Belarus. Because before it seemed that the war would sort of, you know, calm down Lukashenko a bit, that he might a bit ease the repression, um, bearing in mind how people are unhappy about the war, uh, that he would like to regain some popularity. But actually, on the contrary, we have, in the recent two weeks, we have seen a new, yet another assault on civil society in Belarus. We have seen uh, um, that around 220 uh, um, trade union leaders have been um, arrested, rounded up. We have also seen that the Belarusian parliament, for example, has changed um, the law and now intent um, for terrorism, not intent of terrorism, sorry, might... Um, might, might be punished with the death penalty. And again, we know that in Belarus, 
any um, opposition activity can be classified as basically terrorism. And in fact, the leaders of the Belarusian opposition, they all have been charged with terrorism charges. So instead of sort of, uh, um, instead, instead, instead of hoping that the war in Ukraine might somehow weaken Lukashenko, because that was obviously a very miscalculated decision for him, in the sense that together with Putin, he had hoped that it, uh, Russia would be victorious in for a day's time and he could um, extract great dividends. That did not happen. And despite the fact that the security services are unhappy, we can see that Lukashenko is still very anxious. He still worries that perhaps this frustration um, of the people in Belarus, the rising living um, costs, which is the result of sanctions, have frustrated people to the extent that they might be able to um, resume the protest. And this is what he's worried, um, uh, worried about at the moment. Thank you, Katya. Those are some really interesting uh, developments uh, in Belarus. Let's turn to Peter again, and we'll talk about uh, Hungary. Now, uh, several weeks into Russia's full-scale military invasion of Ukraine, uh, Orban singled out Ukrainian President Zelensky as an enemy of the Hungarian nation. Now, what's been Orban's relationship with Zelensky, and what do you make of this aforementioned statement? I mean, earlier you mentioned, for example, how these elections in Hungary uh, impacted on, on some of the political messaging. Um, and maybe related to this point, are you starting to see any significant changes with regard to Hungary's position uh, within the EU and NATO regarding the war, which I guess relates to the point you made earlier about this careful balancing act? Thank you, Peter. Yes, I, I would say that Hungary have gone a long way when it comes to the uh, supporting of the sanctions, for example, we can remember that at the 2nd of February, Viktor Orban standing next to Vladimir Putin on a press conference told that Hungary is not about to support any kind of sanctions further towards Russia. And that, and, and we have already had five uh, sanctions rounds. Also, Hungary have lifted its, its veto on the EU accession of, of Ukraine, which is important, I think, and, and also Ukrainian, Ukrainian uh, diplomats have, have expressed their gratitude for that. Um, on the other hand, uh, yes, Orban was clearly, I think, the only EU leader who picked up uh, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky as, as an enemy in the, in the campaign, and also when he was making his victory speech, he listed uh, Volodymyr Zelensky together with the international uh, press, together with Brussels, uh, together with George Soros, Volodymyr Zelensky as, as one of the enemies he had to fight against. And uh, I, I'm not sure it was in itself uh, so successful in whipping uh, up the support for Viktor Orban. I think he could have won the election even without that. But as I said, it sent a positive feedback to him that this is uh, something that that uh, that works and this is something that the Hungarian people uh, need. I think he did not really calculate it with how disastrous it is going to be to the reputation of, of Hungary. Volodymyr Zelensky, for good reasons, I think is greeted as a hero in the whole Western world. So picking him up as your main enemy is probably not the wisest idea. If you want to have friends uh, in the Western world, in the alliances, in the EU and the NATO, where, where you belong, and in the alliances where, where uh, I mentioned that already, Hungary's reputation is, is worse than ever before. Uh, the interesting thing is that back to 2008, Viktor Orban, when Viktor Orban was in opposition uh, and he came back to power to 2010, uh, he said that Georgia and Ukraine should be welcome into the NATO immediately. And after the uh, Russian attack against Georgia, the clear statement of Fidesz back then was a very Atlanticist response 
claiming that that the sooner uh, Russia and Georgia, uh, sorry, sooner Ukraine and Georgia will will join NATO, the the better it will be for the Western world because it can prevent the further military aggression of of Russia. Right now, Orban uh, falls short of very strongly condemning the uh, events uh, in Ukraine. And also after the genocide we could see unfolding in Bucha and elsewhere, and there is uh, more and more robust uh, evidence for that. He, he, the Hungarian position is still that there is a need for careful investigation of what really have happened. And, and uh, yeah, it's uh, Deputy Prime Minister Kaczynski from Poland told that if Orban doesn't see what is happening in Bucha, then he has to go to an eye doctor to, to take care of his, his eyes because it's, it's so obvious. So you, I, I'm just saying that to illustrate how deep the rift between Hungary and even uh, Poland have become because of, of this uh, outlierism that, that uh, I mentioned. And, and the question is, uh, I mean, the interesting thing is that we can see that there is some kind of rally around the flag effect in most of the European countries as a result of the war in countries where there were very hawkish responses, like let's say in Poland, uh, let's say the cheerleader of, 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 of Europe when it comes to, to stepping up against uh, uh, the escalation of the war and in supporting uh, Ukraine, um, and where we could see dovish responses like like uh, Hungary as well. Uh, but the uh, when when we uh, are let's say measuring the responses, Ukrainian responses to to Hungary's outlierism. Of course, we have to take into consideration as well is that that this is a a poisoned diplomatic relationship and recently we could just hear uh, from from a, a quite important uh, Ukrainian uh, a leader that that um, Orban could have hoped that transcarpathia parts of of uh, the territory of Ukraine uh, will come back to to Hungary as a result of the war and he knew it in advance from Putin that that he's going to attack Ukraine. I don't I don't give credit to this statement for the reason that it was a very visible surprise for Viktor Orban that the war broke out. He was rather in the naive camp who thought that it's not going to happen. I don't think he had any additional information than than any other of the um, Western leaders had. He he just failed to assess the the uh, situation in the sense that how likely uh, the Russian invasion is, but he was not completely alone in that. So I'm just saying that there is a, this bitter relationship. Uh, Volodymyr Zelensky have, have attacked personally Viktor Orban on, on one of the European Council meetings and then Orban and the whole uh, Hungarian government uh, propaganda machinery decided uh, to go against Ukraine. The problem is that Hungarian state-owned media is still in this campaign mode and uh, the Hungarian state-owned media is, is the most important source of Russian disinformation in Hungary and unfortunately it prevailed. My organization, Political Capital Institute and, uh, and the Hungarian HCLU have filed a complaint to the European Commission because of that there is a state-sponsored actor that is spreading Russian disinformation in Hungary. And unfortunately, we can see the impact of that on the Hungarian public opinion. 76% of Hungarians, according to an Ipsos poll, thinks that what happens in Ukraine is none of Hungary's business and we have to uh, keep out of that. And just for comparison, in Poland, this figure is 27%. So it uh, makes quite uh, a difference. And I think, what we and and one more proof for that this is not just let's say Hungarian selfishness in general, but the impact of the governmental uh, disinformation campaign is that in another issue, welcoming refugees, uh, Hungarians are mostly uh, welcoming, and and uh, in why we could see quite a lot of anti-immigrant and anti-refugee campaigns in the last few years in this very topic. The official governmental narrative is that we have to welcome refugees. Most of them go further to the West or go to Poland or elsewhere, but still Hungary at least lets uh, refugees 
in the country without any kind of, let's say, uh, ethnic discrimination. And this is an important move. And you can see it in the public uh, opinion as well. So Orban has the most concentrated, more centralized media system in, in yeah. all Europe. Uh, he have mostly used it for, for bad purposes, unfortunately, if we look back uh, since the beginning of the war. But in one segment, I mean, the but, Tower thank you, Peter. use it for good. All right, good. Thank you. Um, so we'll keep our eyes on the um, on the on the official narrative there coming from uh, many of the state-owned media houses there in uh, Hungary to get a sense of to keep our fingers close to Orbán's political pulse, I guess. Uh, let's now turn to Bogdan. Bogdan, very briefly, uh, what type of political and military support has Poland provided to Ukraine and what are the main debates in Poland, EU and NATO surrounding those issues? Thank you. Thank, thanks, Alan. So Poland has started uh, providing Ukraine with military assistance uh, already in 2015-2014. Uh, uh, so again, we have like two stages or two types of military assistance. In the first few years, um, our efforts were more focused on uh, helping Ukrainian artists to reform the army. So there were we are providing their um, officers with uh, training sessions, and uh, however, there were also some sort of military equipment pro um, delivered to Ukrainian forces. Uh, and everything, of course, then we had the second stage uh, that started a few months before the war started, and. Um, in this uh, stage, we had, we started, uh, we provided actually more kind of hard uh, equipment to Ukraine. So according to the recent um, recent data, the um, Poland uh, in the second stage uh, has provided the total meter assistance. Uh, so the total like amount of this uh, assistance is like 1.5 billion euro worth. Uh, which I believe is a significant um, support. Uh, we, of course, do not have the detailed information about the uh, about the types of equipment or the types of uh, weapon that is provided. Um, so, according to our officials, uh, this is mostly like drones, uh, special ammunition. Uh, however, there are some there is some information that uh, there is also over two hundred tanks T seventy two M provided to uh, to Ukrainian army. Uh, this took place like in the last couple of days, uh, and uh, in addition to this, uh, there are some uh, combat uh, vehicles, uh, the number of one hundred. And uh, but I guess I still I have to say that this is not like confirmed by. Uh, Polish authorities. Uh, so this was the, this is like the most, uh, so this is the military assistance we provide to Ukraine. Uh, concerning the debates that are taking place here, uh, or some changes even, um, in mid-April, uh, Polish uh, parliament uh, voted the new Hem homeland, so-called uh, homeland, uh, homeland defense law. And according to the, this law, our military spending starting 2023 will uh, raise or in, increase to 3% uh, of GDP. Uh, so um, there's a whole package uh, that's um, supposed to help to reform our army to make it more modern, more responsive to the, uh, to the po possible, well, uh, possible Russian uh, aggression in our country. And also we, uh, put a lot of efforts on the international level. And in, so here we uh, expect or we negotiate with our partners from NATO. Uh, I just uh, remind you that there will be a NATO summit in June this year. Well, probably big decisions will be made. So we are still now, now negotiating the, uh, those decisions. And but what is expected from us is to definitely strengthen the Eastern flank uh, that means that we expect from uh, most from the U.S. Uh, Army, from U.S. government, to locate to open the permanent military bases in our territory. Uh, uh, but it's just not only in Poland, but also in Romania and Baltic Baltic states. Uh, so this is like the the most important important changes in our military policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bogdan. Uh, those are great points also that you made there, uh, especially that last point you made about, uh, you mentioned about the strengthening of the eastern flank, which I know is also very much a priority of the Baltic countries. 
Uh, Yonella, let's ask you uh, a question um, and please be brief in the response. Uh, now, as the focus of uh, Russian aggression has moved to the south of Ukraine, the Black Sea and the Mar and maritime security are in the spotlight. Now, can you explain to us why the Black Sea is so instrumental for both Russia and Romania slash NATO security? Thank you. Thank you very much, Leon. Uh, so, very shortly, the Black Sea region, it's a currently a region that is dominated by geopolitical uh, instability. And uh, as I briefly mentioned before, it's the most vulnerable part uh, in both security strategies of the European Union and NATO. Um, because in the past eight years, Russia has uh, increased and developed uh, its Black Sea fleet and expanded its area of dominance in the Black Sea since the annexation of Crimea. And we saw in the past couple of weeks uh, how Kremlin is using the Black Sea fleet in shelling the southern Ukrainian cities. And we also have to keep in mind that they have the capabilities to project uh, power uh, towards the Mediterranean Sea, Western Balkans and Middle East. That's why the Black Sea is very important for uh, Russians, but also for NATO. Uh, because if Russia will succeed in encroaching the whole Black Sea and uh, have dominance in this region, will basically um, buffer uh, NATO maritime um, strategy in the future. We don't have one, but I hope that, um, as my colleague Bogdan mentioned, uh, at the Madrid summit, NATO will have more ambitions towards the Black Sea and they will decide in creating a Black Sea a strategy uh, with a, a naval maritime security uh, presence. Why is this important for Romania? Once, because we have to keep in mind the maritime security of the NATO EU littoral states, which are Romania and Bulgaria. And um, mostly they uh, needed um, the NATO naval ships to protect and deter against Russian interference. Currently, the, as um, we have the war in Ukraine, um, basically Turkey, who uh, it's uh, the country who has the right, the international right, according to Montreux Convention, to close the Bosphorus Strait. They close the Bosphorus Strait to any warships. That means both Russia and NATO. So we don't have any uh, NATO uh, ship um, in, in American or um, um, British ships, uh, in warships in uh, the um, uh, sea that can project naval uh, security for Romania and Bulgaria. So this is an issue. Uh, it's also important from the economical perspective, um, the fact that R Russia next uh, Ukraine, and now they also occupy the Serpent Island, which is 45 kilometers away from Romanian land. So it's very close, <laughs> the war is happening at the Romanian uh, gates as um, not, met not only metaphorical, but practically. That means that we can have some issue with the economic exclusive zones that might overlap. And that creates an issue. For example, I will give you a um, uh, situation. If Romania will finally decide to uh, exploit its Black Sea gas reserves, basically th that will be uh, somehow an issue because it will have to do that among Russian warships and then they will have the uh, problem who owns the rights to exploit that economic exclusive zones um, on one uh, side and the third element it's on few food security so Black Sea it's also important from uh, the food security perspective not only of the entire region but also other regions around the world because um, this uh, region the Black Sea states uh, are considered the bread basket and they were providing cereals for um, uh, and wheat and uh, corn for uh, also sunflower oil as an example, for various um, countries around the world. So this uh, creates uh, also food security problem. So what 
I would like you to remember it's that the Black Sea is transforming nowadays in Europe's new Kaliningrad as Russia continues unhindered its encroachment of the sea. Thank you, Ian Alham. I'm having some sound issues. I, I only caught some of that, but I will re listen to this uh, recording also. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Katya, unfortunately, had to um, leave us, and, and if any of the panelists have to leave, please just, just let me know. Um, but uh, Peter, if I could ask you another question, if possible. Um, we have a question here from one of our audience members about uh, conspiracy theories circulating that Putin promised old, quote-unquote, Hungarian territories from Ukraine in case of Russia's victory. Is there any evidence of this? Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. I, this is what I, I referred to before. This is a statement by uh, Alexei Danilov as well uh, that, that he made uh, yesterday. Um, and and it's, it's practically coming from the Ukrainian president's office. We, we can say beforehand it was circulated more like a conspiracy theory by Roman Giertich um, from, from Poland and, and others. Uh, but it, it reached a level of officiality right now in, in Ukraine. I, I do think that, that um, so far we have not seen any evidence for that, and it's really not my job how to say to, to defend the Hungarian government um, from, from allegations like that. On, on the other hand, as, as, I, as I told already, I I saw that the, the impact of the Hungarian, on the Hungarian government of the whole war was an utter surprise. I did not see any, and, and also I, I think if you want to occupy a territory from another country, then you are not claiming immediately that we do not go there with troops, um, not even in NATO and not in, a, uh, in other, other, other capacities. So I, I think that, if Ukraine has some kind of evidence for this claim, they should present it uh, somehow. And I, I, I rather regard it as part of this bitter diplomatic uh, diplomatic war that is that has started to escalating between uh, Ukraine and and um, and Hungary. Uh, this statement is around for a long time that Orban has some kind of revisionist dreams, and he had some strange statements about yeah, history can unfold in interesting times back to 2014, but no evidence so far on any information that Hungary was aware of about that. And I think because of the seriousness of the of this claim, I think we would need some 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 proof to take it uh, seriously. And so far, with a lot of criticism towards Hungary, um, is is being valid. So far, Hungary, have, as I told, uh, supported five rounds of sanctions. Also, NATO troops are are in in Hungarian uh, soil, and also there is an extension, a small extension of the NATO troops. So uh, I, I would not overestimate Hungary's importance in this war. I think Hungary is the most visible outlier, but not outlier in every sense. And so far, I don't think the Hungarian position really changed anything substantially in the, in the Russian-Ukrainian war. Maybe the most important thing is that Hungary does not let lethal weapons to go through its territory, uh, to, uh, through Transcarpathia, directly to, to, to Ukraine. And, and I highly disagree with this, this, uh, this decision, also with the decision that Hungary does not provide bilaterally weapons to Ukraine, but I don't think it had so far any impact on, the, on how the war unfolded. And with all the unfortunate Hungarian rhetoric, I think we should we should we should uh, know that Hungary is really not an important stakeholder in the whole war uh, at the moment. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for that very uh, nuanced answer. Also, um, I I trust you when it comes to Hungarian politics, uh, and I appreciate your perspective. Um, quick final questions, Bogdan. Let's go to you first. Uh, Russia recently halted gas exports to Poland and Bulgaria. What will Poland do to contain or manage the potential energy crisis? Thank you, Bogdan. 
Thank you for this. Uh, thank you for this question. So I believe that Poland is in much better situation than other European countries in this regard uh, when it comes to energy sector. Uh, over the last 15 years, um, all our governments uh, have uh, extensively worked on the diversification of gas supply sources and uh, routes. So uh, we have, uh, for now, we already have the uh, LNG terminal in the, on the Baltic Sea. Uh, we have uh, gas, pipeline, uh, gas pipelines that connect us with Czech Republic, um, uh, uh, Germany and Slovakia. Uh, now, though, this month, the, the new gas pipeline will be uh, open uh, on the Polish, uh, between po I mean, the Polish, uh, Polish, the, it's actually interconnected between Poland and Lithuania. And this will give us access to the Lithuanian energy terminals. Uh, in October this year, uh, the Baltic, so called Baltic pipe, uh, that uh, will uh, bring the gas from Norway via Denmark to Poland will be, will be opened. So, uh, you know, overall, we are not dependent on uh, on the gas, on the Russian gas that much. Uh, as I said, we uh, have made uh, a lot of efforts in the, uh, to, you know, to, to, to become independent, to diversify our gas supply sources. We also have signed contracts with, the, uh, with Qatar and the United States. Uh, we expect uh, large amounts of, of gas uh, to be uh, delivered to Poland uh, by the end of this year and uh, the beginning of next year. Uh, we also raise our uh, capacity of our capacity of our energy uh, uh, terminal. Uh, however, we also have to think in terms of our uh, joint European uh, efforts and uh, and the general situation. Uh, so I believe Poland will have to always eager to cooperate with other countries in the region to also mm, somehow. Um, help them to become uh, less dependent or completely solely independent from from Russian Russian uh, uh, gas. So this is our yeah this is our situation yeah in the gas in the gas sector in our energy sector. Thank you, Bogdan. Uh, some important questions there left for the EU and other member states also on energy on these energy matters uh, for the coming months and years to come. So. Um, uh, Yunella, um, I, let's ask you a final question. Um, you know, I, I know you also study the region. So uh, last week there there were a series of explosions in uh, the Russian-led breakaway province of Transnistria. What's the significance of, of those developments and, and how does Bucharest interpret them? Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very good question uh, concerning uh, to the current situation. Uh, so currently we, we saw these um, uh, attacks on uh, Tiraspol and uh, basically the, the security uh, dangers has increased in Chisinau. There is this idea that um, Russia might utilize Transnistria to attack Ukraine from the west side. Uh, I don't see this as a realistic idea because uh, the, the Russian troops uh, which are stationed in Transnistria currently they are not that well uh, equipped or trained uh, so I'm not sure if they can be uh, of any use in the war against Ukraine but they can be of great use in destabilizing the pro-European government of Moldova. So that's why, basically, if Russia would like to change the pro-European government in Moldova, they can do that without a conventional war. They can do it with propaganda, they can uh, increase more the um, social economic grievances of the Moldovian um, people against the government and how they are dealing with the economical uh, crisis because the country now they suffers from economic crisis they are also highly energy dependent on russia so this is also main issue because the energy sector can be uh, and it was instrumentalized by moscow in its relation with moldova and also they can uh, the fact that um, Moldova is hosting 400,000 of Ukrainian um, refugees, which is roughly around 2% of its population, um, it's putting quite a lot of pressure on the capacities and capabilities of the state. 
So this creates a very vulnerable uh, situation within Moldova. So, so that's why uh, Romania, what Romania did so far, because uh, uh, Romania uh, decided to help Moldova with um, uh, 100 uh, millions of euros. It's a um, uh, it's a credit that we are giving to the um, Moldovan authorities and also um, Romania together with France and Germany created um, uh, it's called conference on Moldova in a platform of financial platform to help uh, economically Moldova to resist to the current challenges brought by these uh, insecurities of uh, energy and also refugees and also post-pandemic insecurities because no one is speaking anymore about the pandemic but we also have the inflation and economic and financial consequences of the pandemic still in place in these vulnerable regions so this is what it's happening in Moldova and Romania it's very much involved in helping um, uh, the, the state also providing somehow some benefits in terms of energy transition uh, um, but uh, these are like in in the early uh, stages so more will have to be done in this uh, uh, energy support that Romania can do to Moldova towards Moldova thank you very much Inela and and uh, it's a good reminder also that we will have more on Moldova in the coming weeks uh, uh, with regards to the Russia-Ukraine dialogues that we host. So we'll we'll have a special panel on that at some point also because uh, it's it's one of those countries that we don't talk much about, um, uh, you know, just for the past few weeks compared to a country like Poland, for example. Um, I would like to thank all four panelists, Katia. Peter Bogdan, Unella, uh, thank you for your insights. I kind of, I feel like we needed another hour or two to discuss these issues. I'd like to thank you for your time, and um, I hope to have you back on these panels in the future. And a friendly reminder to our audience: we do these dialogues every week, and we hope to see you next Tuesday. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>